think I think most people think of the mu when they think of the music industry and like the record labels and stuff, they think of the '70s or the '90s where it was like the record label gives you like a million dollars and da, da, da. and at that time that did happen. The Family Chris started as a recording project, so we we weren't trying to uh, to be a band. We were trying to actually just make a an album that we could be proud of. I don't know what the German word for jaded is, but we were kind of jaded, um, and we were in a position that we felt like we were just making music, hoping to make money off of it, you know, and, and we didn't like that place artistically. We kind of felt like if you're gonna make music, you should, you know. The priority is to like make something you're proud of and make something that you think artistically is, is giving something to the world. And so we started the band based on that. We asked friends and, and people online who wanted to collaborate with us for this like final project and we thought we'd get like five. We got like a hundred. Those people now we call the extended family and we kept that going through the band. So every album we ask who wants to be on a record and whoever wants to be on the record, I find a place for them. And we do the same thing for live shows too. So we, in the States, a lot of times we have friends and like new people, fans that jump on stage and play different instruments with us at different shows. And I think uh, on this next run of Germany, we're gonna do it with the first time in, in Europe with a bunch of Europeans. So I'm really excited about it. This day and age, I think because of, you know, we live in two different worlds. You know, we live in this world and we live in this world. And I think unfortunately, this world provides us with uh, very fast moving time. Uh, and it makes our attention spans really small. And so when you tour as a band, you know, coming to Europe for, like us once a year is almost not, it's worth it for the fans, but it's not, it's really hard to build a fan base that way because people's attention spans are so short. They remember you, but they don't quite remember you unless they see you multiple times. And getting a band of seven people out to Europe is extremely expensive. The flights alone are just like mind boggling. And then you have to rent a van and you know, equipment. The primary idea was, well, we can't get the whole band out here, but we can get me out here. And you know, uh, on the last tour, uh, there are certain things about playing shows in Germany that are a little bit different than the United States. One of them being the length of time. In the US, shows are generally about an hour and then you have about two songs of encores and it's very rare that you get asked to do more encores. And so that's what we came to Germany prepared for and we found out that the sets are more like an hour and a half and then encores will keep going. So if they like you, they'll keep asking for more. Uh, in fact, the first four shows we played, people just kept clapping and we didn't know what to do. Like legitimately, we were like, do we bow? Like, <laughs> And our luckily the fifth show, our booking agent was there and was like, no, they want more music. And the only thing we could do at that point was for me to play acoustic. And people after the show started coming up and saying, well, what, we'd like to see that too. So that's kind of why it started. It was actually just kind of brought up and everyone, the, the lucky thing about my band is that we're all very like-minded people. And the idea of doing, you know, you have to think about the instrumentation of the songs. The last thing that I wanted, uh, that I would ever want with any of the material that, we're, that I'm playing is for it to feel like a cover of a Family Crest song. And if you have, for example, a cello, uh, it's doable, theoretically, because that can handle a lot of different range. It's a, a very vocal instrument. Um, but our cellist wasn't available this time of year. And so it kind of became, well, instead of trying to like force a bunch of instruments in to make this one sound work, what if I just flipped it on end and instead of approaching it with this extreme intensity like we do live, because our shows are very bombastic, kind of approach it with the opposite energy. Look at the, the lyrical content and kind of focus on being vulnerable and a little more like subdued. And it's been a really interesting journey into my own writing because of it. It's been really fun. Uh, this is my second time spending a chunk of time in Germany. Um, I spent the spring of this year in Germany with the band and it's a beautiful country full of wonderful people. It's always funny because I've seen more of Germany than most Germans. <laughs> I'm always like, have you been to uh, Wiestag or Coburg? And people are like, no. no. <laughs> but I, I love Germany, it's a beautiful country. I tend to like smaller cities, so the cities that I like the most in Germany, I found Lübeck for the first time. I think Lübeck is beautiful. I've always liked Coburg, Wiestach, which most people, or Wiestach? Most people don't know it, but it's a really cute little town. But in terms of the larger cities, 
I really like Dresden, actually. Dresden has kind of a small town feel, but it is a big city. So when you're in Dresden, you're talking to people, it doesn't, to me, feel like the same vibe as like a large city. I think the thing that makes it the most difficult, you know, besides the fact that my wife, who is in the band, she's our flute player, is at home and we never have to spend, we're lucky we never have to spend this much time apart, that's difficult. But I think the most difficult part is that when you're on tour, and I think the most interesting, weird thing about being on tour is that it's kind of flipped where it's very rare that I actually am hanging out with people that I know. So the majority of the time, I'm kind of this representative self. Uh, so yeah, it's been difficult, but fun. And honestly, like everyone that I've met on this tour has been what's made it worthwhile. I mean, it's, it's a different, Five. I think the hard part about any show when you're playing something that, you know, with the family crest, it's, it's big. So you can rely on the spectacle of it and the fact that your band is just like, you know, in people's face. And with something like this, it's very, you know, uh, totally polar opposite. You know, it's introspective. And I think the, the hardest thing in, is to just kind of psych your, get yourself into a mental state. And, and, you know, when you're on stage, people, you know, I've talked to people, and usually when people are, like, whispering during a set, it's not chit-chat, it's like they like something, and so they're saying that to a friend. And since I don't speak the language, you never know what someone's saying. So it just feels like talking, and it's really hard when you're in this, trying to get into a zone when suddenly you, you're, like, right there in this... Other than that, just warming up the voice and, and just getting to a place that you can, you know do your job. <laughs> I think that's the other interesting thing though about playing in a country when you're, you know, banter, when you're talking to the audience. That's always so interesting because in America, you know, you, you say something, and people like your band, they like, like what you're doing, and so they're a little more apt to like, you know, like what you're saying. But at any German show that I've played, 30% of the audience probably doesn't speak English, 25% of them kind of speak English, and then the rest of them speak perfect English. But Germany in the winter is very different than the spring. It's very contrastive in comparison. I, and I tend to like winter more, I like cold weather. I did not expect the outpouring that we got. Basically, we have a concept series called The War. And um, Kickstarter is essentially a fundraiser to help fund Act Two, which is the second full album on The War. We decided to do that instead of going with a label because with a project that's this large, you need to have creative control. Uh, you need to be able to put the songs where you want them. You can't have somebody looking over your shoulder and saying, oh, but that's the hit. You need to put that for, you know, it's it's a bigger deal than that. And so, yeah, we decided to go off on our own for this project, which is a very daunting task. But having the support of our fans everywhere has just been astonishing. Yeah, we raised over 100%. Yeah, we our goal was 30,000 30, US, and we raised a little over 40, which... It's going to be very helpful for getting back out here in the spring because we're coming back a whole band. Well, the record is basically done. We're, we're finishing up a lot of like little things, artwork and whatnot. But yeah, the, there's most of it besides like putting the pieces together. Finish, yeah. We've been really fortunate. We have fans all over the place that want to support the band. I think nowadays you kind of need that because music has changed so drastically. I mean, if you grew up in 2002, if that's when you were born, you've never experienced paying for music, really, right? And that changes the way that you think about and appreciate music. So it's always amazing whenever, you know, we've done something like this to see people coming out and wanting to support it because that's not something that a lot of people are used to. The war is this big project, and part of the reason we did a Kickstarter, which is essentially self-funding the record, through the fans is that you know we left our label specifically because we needed creative control and they were like very open to creative control as well like with us but we wanted to have complete creative control because with something like this it's so specific that you kind of have to have that ability to do those kinds of things yeah our fans are amazing so we're very fortunate kickstarter doesn't really change the process of how something is created I think what Kickstarter does is, again, it just kind of reinforces what you do and who supports you. Because nowadays, you know, with Facebook, with Instagram, it's really, really hard to tell who you're reaching. And it's really hard to tell who's real. We want to know what our fans want, what they like, 
We want to have connections with them. But I think the key thing is the Kickstarter, it just kind of reinforces who supports you. And I think that's really important nowadays because, you know, it's the music industry is such an interesting place to try to operate, you know. It's changed drastically. I think, I think most people think of the music, when they think of the music industry and like the record labels and stuff, they think of the 70s or the 90s where it was like, the record label gives you like a million dollars and da, da, da. And at that time, that did happen. You know, like when you ask a band, when you're like, we want to put you out there into the world and the only way to get you to the level that we need to get you there is for you to give us 100% of your life, you do kind of have to, or you should give a band X amount of dollars so that they can make sure that their families are taken care of. They can make sure they don't have to work and they don't, they don't have to pay for their apartment, you know, while they're on the road, right? That seems standard, even if it's recouped which means that, you know, even if you have to pay the record label back eventually, right? Nowadays, you, you make your own record, you produce your own record, you mix your own record, you master your own record, you, you buy all the merchandise, and then you go out and you spend the money on the tour. And when you really tally that up, I mean, it's, it's very, 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 very expensive. And it's a wonder that artists can do it. And again, going back, like, that's why Kickstarter is so important, because without Kickstarter, like, we really couldn't release this record. Even though we, we do everything we can, we've taught ourselves how to record everything. And even with us recording everything and doing all that kind of stuff, you're still in a position where you're like, well, you still gotta mix it, you still gotta master it, you, know, you still gotta tour it, you know. Technically speaking, if you wanna listen to music, you don't have to pay for it. And that's really sad because, again, like artists pay thousands, tens of thousands of dollars. That's not counting the time that they're not getting paid for the, for the work that they're putting in. And they're really kind of not able to survive like so many bands you know it's weird we live in a time where you can literally hear any band which is amazing you can find stuff that you never could have found before but so many of those bands will only last one record because they just can't afford to keep going the war act 2 is the record that my band has been waiting to release the entire time we've been a band i started writing it when we were mixing essentially when we were mixing our first record it was supposed to be our second record Beneath the Brine just organically turned into a record. It was supposed to be an EP. And then the story, because there was all this time, the story grew and, and changed. Act one started and then act two and so forth. And it's interesting because you have music that was written that long ago. You have music that was written like two years ago. Uh, it's just this span of 10 years of my life where artistically you're hearing all that. And I think what's, what's really interesting about it is that while the songs have been written over this span, it was all composed and orchestrated basically about the same time. I mean, we do have a tendency to jump from genre to genre to genre. And I think with this, it, it just feels like a, I don't know, it just feels like a clean, cohesive record. I'm so ridiculously excited to get it out. I think the most interesting thing with our fan base, is, and this is what I wanted, people kind of creating their own story. I think it's this, I think it's this. And sometimes people are like real close to the point that I'm like, oh, that's eerie. And sometimes people are like way out in left field, but it's still really cool. And I think that's the point of art. You know, I was listening to an interview with Wynn Butler from Arcade Fire, and he said something about, they asked, they asked what a song was about. And the, the woman interviewing him said, I think it's about this. And he's like, then that's, that's what it's about. She's like, well, but what is it about to you? And he's like, I'm not gonna tell you that because that doesn't matter. It matters what it means to you. And while I do think that, I do think it matters to know what an artist's context was, I never thought about it in that context. And I was like, well, if, can you do both? Can you give someone their context for an extended period of time and then give them your context? and give them two different ways to hear that piece of music. That's kind of the goal, yeah. The most important song, I think, is Beneath the Brine. Mainly because for me, it was the first song I'd ever written that didn't start with a guitar. It was the first song that I ever wrote that was orchestral first. It was not a song that we thought would be popular. It's funny because Beneath the Brine, it starts Beneath the Brine, the album, and Make Me a Boat finishes it. They're both very big, because we wanted them to kind of be the bookends of the record. Never expected that those would be the songs people would want to hear. And those were the songs everybody wants to hear. And they're very high. So every night now I have to sing them, which is not something I was anticipating. Yeah, I think that that song really sets the tone for who we are as a band. 
in terms of most important song to me, it's probably one of the songs on Act Two. It very well might be a song on Act Three. I, you know what? I'll give you. I'll give you. There's a song in Act Three called "Pick Up a Piece." That might be my most personal song. After a tour is very strange. Everyone, I think, thinks that your life is not structured. They think that it's crazy, and they think that it's vacation. Tour is a lot of work. You're pretty much constantly working, and your day is hyper scheduled. So, you know, literally, you know when you're going to be able to use the restroom. It's that scheduled because you're like, I have to get from point A to point B. There's these three stops. This is when we're gonna need gas. Let's try to hold it till then, you know, that kind of a thing. So you have this very structured set. You have a purpose. Every night, it's kind of like, yes, you have a purpose, you have a purpose. And then you get home from tour and the first five days are amazing because you're kind of a, a tourist in your own city because you're doing all of the things that you, you missed about home in a very short amount of time. But then after five days, you kind of go through this weird kind of depression where you're like, what is my purpose now? I don't have a schedule anymore, what am I doing? You know, Even if you have a job, it just feels weird. I'm working on my first batch of solo songs that are very different than Family Crest. Don't know when it'll be released, but I played a bunch of them tonight. And uh, I'm just really looking forward to getting this album out and getting back on the road and seeing everyone throughout the United States and throughout Europe.